Hi there, my name is Kira Tom. And I'm Kevin Demery. We're students from the University of Alberta. And today we're going to talk to you about tube thoracostomy, also known as chest tube insertion. Objectives to be covered in this video include the following. Number one, indications, contraindications, and complications of tube thoracostomy. Number two, preparation, including appropriate equipment and patient positioning. Number three, to demonstrate a step-by-step -step guide to chest tube insertion, as you are most likely to come across this procedure in a trauma setting, and it is difficult to appreciate how it is done. And finally, number four, daily management of the chest tube and its drainage system. As stated, you are most likely to see a chest tube insertion in a trauma patient in the setting of a hemothorax or pneumothorax, but other indications include pleural effusions and pleurodesis. As tube thoracostomy can be a life-saving procedure, the contraindications listed below are only relative and are mostly concerned with site choice. However, in the outpatient setting, these contraindications hold more weight. The most common complication of tube thoracostomy is malposition of the chest tube, whether this be puncturing of the lung parenchyma or inadequate entry of the side ports into the pleural space. Other complications include injury to adjacent tissues, infection, or re-expansion pulmonary edema. As with any operative procedure, preparation is the first and most important step. The first step of preparation is obtaining consent when possible. In the event of a trauma with an unconscious patient, consent may not be able to be given. In general, these are the items you'll need for your chest tube insertion. The first is proper barrier equipment, including face mask with shield, gown, and sterile gloves. You'll next need to prep the patient using betadine or a chlorhexidine solution. You'll also need your local anesthetic with proper syringe and needle. Finally, you'll need to assemble your chest tube tray. On your chest tube tray, you should have a scalpel with an appropriate blade, in our case, a number 11 blade, Kelly's, either straight or curved, suture scissors, needle drivers, toothed or non-toothed pickups, chest tube adapters, suture, usually O-silk, drapes, kidney basin for sharps and other accessories, gauze, if needed, tubes for fluid collection, and of course, your chest tube itself. The size of a chest tube depends upon the indication for the chest tube in the first place. In a pneumothorax, where the chest tube will serve as a conduit for air, a smaller chest tube may be used. For example, a 20 French chest tube. When draining fluid or even clots from the pleural space, a larger chest tube must be used. For example, in an empyema, a 28 French chest tube should be used. In a hemothorax, a 32 French to 34 French chest tube should be used. In general, in a trauma setting, a 36 French or larger chest tube is recommended. Once all the relevant supplies have been found, you are now ready to insert your chest tube. First, you must position the patient appropriately, either fully supine or at an angle for comfort. Next, the ipsilateral arm must be fully abducted behind the head. This provides significant and full exposure to the area. In a trauma setting, full exposure may be limited. Next, the location of the chest tube must be chosen. Generally, clinicians choose 
the mid to anterior axillary line at approximately the fourth and fifth intercostal space. This site can be approximated using the nipple line in men and the inframammary crease in women. This site is chosen as there is minimal underlying musculature and the risk of damaging adjacent organs is least. Next, the site must be prepped using chlorhexidine or an alternative antiseptic agent. Next, the clinician should don appropriate sterile gloves and maintain sterile technique throughout the remainder of the procedure. Next, the patient can be draped appropriately using sterile drapes. While draping, it is imperative to maintain appropriate exposure of the chest tube site. Local anesthetic is infiltrated into the skin and subcutaneous tissue one intercostal space below the desired level of the chest tube, as this will be our incisional level. The difference in chest tube level and incisional level is such that a tunnel through the subcutaneous tissue is created to help decrease the rate of air entry upon chest tube removal. Then using your scalpel, make a 1 to 2 centimeter incision parallel to the intercostal space at the site of the anesthetic infiltration. Then using a Kelly, blunt dissect through the subcutaneous tissue, cephalad toward the desired intercostal space. Being sure to always use two hands to stabilize the Kelly. At this point, local anesthetic should again be infiltrated into the inferior and superior periosteum, the surrounding musculature, and the parietal pleura. Again using the Kelly, advance the Kelly using a two-handed technique towards the intercostal muscles, taking care to avoid the neurovascular bundle on the inferior aspect of the superior rib. Once the intercostal muscles are reached, you may spread the Kelly, thereby opening up the intercostal muscles and exposing the pleura. Again, with the Kelly clamp closed, advance the Kelly using a two-handed technique again. However, this time, keeping your index finger approximately two centimeters from the tip of the Kelly clamp. This step is essential, as when you puncture the pleura, it prevents the Kelly from thrusting into the thoracic cavity. Again, as we advance, avoiding the neurovascular bundle on the inferior aspect of the superior rib. Once you reach the, uh, the pleura, Gradually advance with controlled pressure until you feel a distinctive pop 
that will be the Kelly puncturing the parietal pleura. Next, gently spread open your Kelly, expanding the hole within the parietal pleura, and slowly retract the Kelly clamp. Next, insert your finger through the subcutaneous tract and into the pleural space. Ensure that you are indeed in the pleural space and that there are not significant adhesions. If you do encounter significant adhesions, stop and consult ultrasound guidance or CT guidance or choose another chest tube location. If there are no adhesions and you're sure that there is a clear tract, retract your finger and ready your chest tube. Using the Kelly, clamp at the very tip of the chest tube. The Kelly will aid in positioning the chest tube inside the pleural cavity. Once inside the pleural cavity, secure your chest tube with one hand and remove the Kelly. Then using your dominant hand, gradually advance the chest tube into the pleural space. If you have a pneumothorax, you will be advancing superiorly, whereas if you are attempting to drain a fluid, you will advance it inferiorly. The chest tube should be advanced so that all drainage holes are inside the pleural cavity. This is approximately 2 centimeters past the last drainage hole. 